uh, I'm happy you guys picked the best one. So, <laughs> so basically, our talk is on graph neural networks today, which is basically neural networks on graph structure data, machine learning on graph structure data. Uh, but we go more into it. We go into uh, filtering, uh, uh, filtering data. Like we try to teach you the entire workflow. So how to handle the tensors with PyTorch, and then how you handle uh, your graphs with the graph library network X. And then we basically uh, connect all of them together to get to you to DGL, which is your deep graph library for uh, graph learning. Yeah. And then at the end, uh, we have some graph signal processing. So effectively, the workshop will, since it's quite late, right? It's 6.30, yeah. Uh, effectively, everything you need to know about like implementing GNNs, it can be, will be done in like the first one and a half hour to two hours, right? Then after that, we go into some graph uh, spectral, uh, graph signal processing, which is spectral filtering on graph, graphs, uh, graphs. So like band pass filtering, low pass filtering, heat diffusion, uh, and then spectral GNNs, right? So spectral, like idea of convolution, spectral convolution applied to GNNs. But uh, that, the math is more advanced for that. Yeah. So the math for this workshop will be, I guess, slightly uh, unwieldy to some degree because it's a bit abstract. But it gets more abstract as you move further on. So uh, if you just capture the basic idea of it, it's good enough, really. You don't have to fully understand it. Yeah, don't understand it, feel it, feel it, yeah. That's a quote from my professor. So anyway, who are we first of all? Uh, so basically, I'm Zion. Uh, I'm Zion. This is Jed. Jed, say hi. Uh, this is Mahir, and this is Kabir. And we're all from uh, NUS High School, which is uh, yeah, it's a JC in Singapore. And uh, me and Jed are both 18, JC two. And those two, uh, and Mahir and Kabir are both 17, JC one. So Mahir and Kabir are like our facilitators for today. The They'll help you guys if you need any technical help. Me and Jed are the ones who are doing all the presenting and uh, if you have any questions, you can ask us. So let's get into it. So first of all, what is a graph, right? So a graph is a, basically a data structure with vertices and edges, right? So vertices are basically the, uh, the nodes of the graph, right? Or these like these, oops, Jed, what's your pen? So vertices are basically these things, right? Uh, they're called the they're called they're also called nodes, right? And basically they're uh, they're uh, and then the things that connect between them are the edges or the links between the graphs, right? So essentially graphs are made of vertices and edges, and they're meant to represent pairwise relationships in them, right? So for example, how could you use uh, graphs to represent data, right? So for example, states in a puzzle. If you guys play chess, right? Nodes in a chessboard, right, can be viewed as, uh, as uh, edges in a graph. And the states of the chessboard that can, are connected by the moves can be viewed as, like, for example, uh, the vertices in the graph. So you see, in this case here, this is a game called uh, Sliding Puzzle, right? It used to be packaged on Windows. But uh, effectively, uh, states in the puzzle are the vertices, and then the connections or the moves between those puzzle states are your edges, right? Uh, another way is chemistry. Your bonds in your chemistry are your edges, and your uh, atoms are your nodes or vertices. Yeah. And then uh, we also put urinal diagrams because me and Jed are doing a bit data database module now. But essentially, like uh, your entities and your relations are your nodes, and the connection between them are your edges. So basically, there's a lot of data that can be represented uh, via graphs, right? So that's why we need a, we have we have a, we need to have like some way to do learning on this kind of graph structure data. Right, and that's where graph neural networks come in. Right, so some example tasks for graph neural networks is neural combinatorial optimization. So I recently did a research project, right, where I had to, I used uh, graph neural networks uh, to solve longest simple path, which is an NP hard uh, problem on like a fixed vertex size. So essentially, you can use your graph neural networks to get a heuristic, and then you can feed that heuristic into some sort of best first search algorithm to uh, to do neural combinatorial optimization. In fact, I think there are a few cutting edge Rubik's Cube solving algorithms right now. Not as good as the A star one, but uh, that use graph neural networks. So you can use it for neural combinatorial organization. It's been widely used in traveling salesman problems. There's a lot of research on that if you guys want to check that out. Yeah. Then chemistry, uh, classifying molecules, toxic, non toxic, looking at the macroscopic molecule, or the microscopic molecule, the molecular structure, guessing its properties. And that can also be a graph learning task. Yeah, 
Then trafficking and networking uh, problems. I guess this is kind of like neural combinatorial optimization, but uh, yeah, essentially shortest path uh, from one place to the next place. How can I get there in the fastest time? Yeah, trafficking and networking. So this talk will be structured in a few ways uh, because we didn't know really like the the average like level of the person who's going to take the talk. So we're going to do a short recap on first uh, artificial neural networks, deep neural networks, and a bit of linear algebra, like matrices, like vectors, right? Because you need to need a bit later on. Then uh, graph theory and uh, the implement uh, and basically the implementation of this graph theory with network X. And then we're going to be covering spatial GNNs, which are GNNs that use uh, spatial convolution operators, right? Which we'll explain to you later. And then we'll talk about the different existing architectures for GNNs, the best ones, the ones that people use a lot. And then we're going to do the implementation in uh, DG, uh, in DGL of the graph neural networks. So it's basically uh, theory, uh, theory code, theory code, theory code. Yeah. And then basically at this point, if you guys want to leave, uh, you can understand because it's quite late. Right, so that's how we structure that. Then after that, yeah. Uh, yeah, we're recording it, so yeah. So because it's quite late, right? We're gonna put the really unwieldy content, which is your graph signal processing and your spectral GNNs at the end. Yeah, I think I mentioned this just now earlier, but uh, yeah. So you guys wanna stick around for that? It's quite interesting. In fact, it's my favorite part of the talk. But we understand that you came here for GNNs, so. If you just want to know how to implement GNNs from start to finish, then you only need to stay up till like here. So after that, uh, no, yeah. okay, I'll start with my intro. Bickering. Let's go into the content. So first, we're going to recap on uh, artificial neural networks. So uh, as you guys know, neural networks are vector-to-vector -vector functions, right? Uh, so for example, this is an R4 to R, uh, R, R1 function. So a four-valued vector to a one-valued vector function. You feed in samples of data. And you feed in output data, and then the neural network has trainable parameters to fit. So these trainable parameters are the weight and biases of the neural network. So we look at a singular neuron of the neural network. Uh, you guys should probably already know this. Essentially, you have the trainable parameters, the weights and the biases. So like the weights and the biases here, and uh, those are uh, trainable uh, to fit the data. And your x is your input data. So for every neuron, you have like these inputs and outputs, right? And then you activate it with a certain kind of activation function. But uh, a non-linear activation function to introduce non-linearity in your model, right? So to represent neural networks in a like a sort of like useful way, we use linear algebra, right? So I'll just do a quick primer a bit on linear algebra. So linear algebra is made up of three things: scalars, vectors, and matrices. So vectors are basically so this is a column vector because the vector is in a column, right? Essentially, it's a way of storing numbers. So for example, this is. Uh, an R4 vector because it's a four length vector down. And then the matrices is n by uh, n by m. So this is a R4 by 3 matrix. Yeah. So matrices are actually linear algebra was originally meant to represent linear equations, like linear relations. So for example, this uh, this uh, equation right here, this simultaneous equation right here can be represented in linear algebra terms. So first, how do these things commute, right? How do they relate to each other? Uh, uh, how, how do you multiply them together, right? So to multiply a matrix by a vector, right? You take the first row of the matrix and the first and the vector, and you basically element-wise multiply and sum. So if if I want to get the first value of the vector, of the, the vector that comes from the matrix and the vector, I take W11 times L11, W12 times uh, plus W12 times uh, L21, and that becomes my first value. So you're multiplying every row of the first matrix by the column of the vector, basically. Yeah. So, and, and then you can multiply, a, this is an example of multiplying a row vector by a column vector. So it's the same thing, you're multiplying every column by every row. Yeah. So then you can add this finally to matrix matrix multiplication, where you start off by uh, multiplying W11 uh, times X11 plus W12 times X21, and then that's how you get the first value. So it's like this. This will give us this. Then this, this will give us this. Yeah, and uh, basically that's commutation, that's multiplication in matrices. So the original uh, so there's some uh, rules about matrix multiplication that you should know that will be relevant to the talk later on and uh, now. So basically addition and subtraction are all element-wise. So basically if I have a vector uh, here like AB and I add a vector CD to it, Right, it will the, the net vector will be a plus c and b plus d. 
So addition and subtraction are all element wise, yeah. Let me erase. How's your eraser work? Yeah. Okay, so you hold it down, or you just press. You, you do. Okay, anyway, I'll continue. And then multiplying a scalar by a vector is uh, is also element wise. So if I have a vector a b and I multiply it by some scalar six, six, then the resulting vector will be six a six b, right? Yeah, erase the top. Yeah. So there's uh, some few matrices that you should know about. Uh, one is the identity matrix. This is like saying one in higher dimensions. The, essentially, the matrix is uh, the entire diagonal of the matrix is all just ones, right? Then you have uh, matrix inversion. So essentially, for certain kinds of matrices, there can be a matrix that exists such that when you multiply it by that original matrix, it, be, it returns you the identity matrix for that size. So that's called matrix inversion. And it can only be done for square matrices with the same number of rows and columns. So you see here, 3 times 4 plus 11 times negative 1 is 1. So yeah, that's how, that's uh, matrix inversion. So you'll need that a lot later on. In fact, you don't even know it now. So, and then final thing you have to know is transposition, which is basically you flip the values of the matrix across the top diagonal. So if I, I basically flip the, the values across this diagonal. So 5, five and 0 swap. 3 and 2 swap, uh, 2 and 0 swap. Yeah, so that's a uh, matrix transposition. And you can do it for higher, like uh, irregular matrices, meaning non square rectangular matrices. You just always look at the top value, the, the top left value of the matrix, basically like the first value in the matrix here. And then you basically draw a diagonal line from there and then you flip accordingly. Yeah, so like for example, if I have a, just a single vector uh, AB, right, I look at the top value and then I see the diagonal associated with it, which is like this. Right, and then I therefore the transpose is just A. Therefore, the transpose is just A B. Yeah. Let me connect my drawing tablet. <laughs> so that means this. Wait, I'll keep talking while you can connect it. Okay, sorry. So basically, it transpose on the top diagonal, essentially. So the original motivation behind vectors and matrices, right, was that vectors are basically n-dimensional arrows from origin, and then matrices are transforms which scale and rotate the vector. So, like for example, we have a vector here, one, two, right, and basically, we when we multiply by this matrix, it transforms the vector in a certain way by rotating the vector. So it rotates the vector, and then it also scales that vector. So yeah, that's the idea of the original motivation. So how can this be applied to real that works finally? Right? Sorry for the mathematical break. But essentially, um, oh, oh yeah, let's see, just my pen Okay, thanks. Yeah, sure. So essentially, uh, we can represent a four by two layer like this with a four by two weight matrix, right? Because if there are four inputs and two outputs that are eight weights, so you can represent that with a matrix. And then you can represent your, your neural network layer by your matrix vector multiplication. So this is your vector of inputs, your x1, uh, x2, x3, and x4. Yeah, just finding another screen. Okay, yeah. So like this is your this is your matrix, your vector, your input vector. Then you can multiply it by this weight matrix, and then you get your output vector. So yeah, that's the benefit of it. So then you, the activation function is just some nonlinear function. In this case, it's sigmoid, but you can use any nonlinear function. Yeah. So all you have to know about major, uh, uh, GNNs is that it's a vector to vector function. You take in a vector, you get an output vector, and your kernel parameters are your weight matrix and your bias matrix. So your weight matrix is used to uh, uh, basically transform from one layer to the next. Then you add some bias term, and then you activate it. So that's just how GNNs uh, are generated. So I know this may seem useless for now, but uh, we use linear algebra to, uh, for uh, the GNN part as well, both for computation and the motivation behind how spatial GNNs work. They both rely on like linear algebra. So uh, this is just like a primer. So actually, the reason why GNNs work right is because they have a large amount of uh, trainable parameters, right, which allows it to like be flexible and fit a lot of data. And essentially, repeated linearity can mimic non-linearity. And the activation adds like basically more non-linear characters to the model. 
So what do I mean by this? Uh, so I'm going to give you a high level explanation of like universal approximation theorem. But instead, I'll just show you this cool graph. So here's an example of data, right? Uh, assuming I want to fit the white circle in between, right? The ideal fit would be like this circle nonlinear function, right? This circular nonlinear function, right? But what our neural network does is, is it essentially uh, adds multiple line segments or multiple linear sections that mimic this nonlinearity. So by adding many lines together, we can get this nonlinear circle. So even though this is not a circle, by having multiple lines, it mimics like the properties of the circle. Yeah. So uh, to, to measure the error in a function, we use a loss function. That's, yeah, you don't know much about that. Common use is L2 norm and L1 norm. And then to calculate the values of the actual weights, we use uh, back propagation. But uh, back propagation is usually done all by the library, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, I'll show you in like a second how we do it, but uh, yeah, you don't have to worry about how we use back, uh, back propagation. So now you guys can try out some notebook work with, if you have your laptop here. Uh, essentially, it's just showing you how you can use uh, PyTorch for uh, solving a simple linear system. So let me open that up. Yo, Jed, open the. Sorry, we're just adding the opening the document now. Okay, so it should be okay. Yeah, sure. Okay, so uh Oh yeah. Okay, yeah. So this is the uh, wrong. Okay, this is the end of book. So essentially, we're going to use PyTorch to solve this simple linear system. So this is a linear equation uh, right here. As I mentioned earlier, you can use your uh, linear equation. You can use uh, linear algebra to represent your linear equation. So in this case, your input your input vector would be w x plus y z ordered as a column vector. And then your coefficients would be a uh, matrix, right? So I just encoded it like this. Uh, and essentially, your y is your uh, ground truth, and your x is basically what you're trying to find, right? So we're trying to solve for w, x, y, and z in the linear system. So we can write it as an equation like this, right? Uh, the double line squared to, that's called the L2 norm, and it's basically our error function. So what we're doing is we're checking uh, for our matrix multiplied by our assumed values of w, x, y, and z minus our actual uh, our actual true values of what ax should be, right? Basically, we're looking at the error between those two terms, okay? And then we're using our real to solve it. So you see, for now, I just set w, x, y, and z to random values with torch or random, right? And then uh, I set my y tensor to uh, just 9, 4, 24, negative 12. So this is your ground truth data. Then we can feed it into our model very simply, uh, like this. So the thing is, right, for uh, your back propagation work, you need to run for a certain amount of iterations or epochs, right? Basically, uh, it's how uh, when are you going to make that step? Is your when you're doing uh, is so essentially for back propagation, right? You can't get the the ideal value for the weight immediately. You have to kind of converge towards it. So because of that, you have to loop over it. A certain number of times. So this gets looped over a thousand times, right? And essentially, at every step, I calculate the, the ideal change of the system. So it's it's a very simple system. Torch dot net mode a comma x, and then our loss is just the comparison function between our what our guess is and our true value is. And then we feed it into our optimizer dot step. So the optimizer I use is stochastic gradient descent optimizer, and then I only feed the variable that I want to optimize there, right? Now I could feed in all the values here. 
But essentially, the optimizer only optimizes values with the requires brand equal true parameter. So uh, essentially, I run my model through that way, and then uh, I can get uh, the ideal values for x. So after after 1,000 iterations, I got the values for w x minus z. One, two, three, four. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I designed this equation myself. Yeah. So uh, for defining neural networks, it's kind of the same way. Essentially, for defining neural networks in uh, Torch, you need to have an initialization and a forward method. So your forward method is your forward pass. Essentially, you feed uh, getting from your original input vector to your output vector the layers you feed it through, and your init is your initialization step for like your weights and whatnot. So for example. Uh, here's our final model that we built, right? Uh, here, so essentially, we define our uh, layers like this. So the sequential step is effectively uh, uh, a way that we can group layers together, and then they're just telling us what we're doing. So what we're doing is we have 784 input, then we are uh, moving it to 512 nodes, then we're adding real activation function, then we're taking that 512 nodes. Then we're adding, uh, we're reducing it to 256 nodes. Then we're adding ReLU again. Uh, then we're doing uh, one final linear layer to 10. And then we use a final activation function called softmax to get our final values, right? And you can define that with nn.sequential, sequential, but it, you can also reapply that thing over and over again. Yeah, the nn dot linear is just your w x plus b weight times x plus, uh, plus b. So yeah, that's effectively torch. So that must have been a lot very boring to you guys because you guys probably already know about DNNs. But uh, essentially, when you go through the full package, so now we're going to go into more of the new content now. So Jed, uh, graph theory. Uh, hello. So now I'll uh, talk about graph theory. Yeah. So uh, graph theory. Yeah. Okay. So what's a graph? Right? So previously, as I mentioned that. Like this is a graph looks like this. You have nodes, and then you have edges between the nodes. So yeah, you can view the nodes as like the sort of elements, and the edges are like the connections between them. And there are two types of graphs. You can have undirected graphs, where you can do something like that. Like you can just traverse the edges in that manner. We can have directed graphs, where basically the edges only point in one direction, so you can only like traverse in one direction. Yeah, so two types of graphs. Now we come to the idea of the degree of a node. So the degree of a node in the graph is basically the number of connections to like that node. So for example, okay, uh, this is three, and then it's like two connections. And then for example, one over there also has two connections, but like four has only one connection. So we can represent this in a degree matrix, which basically says like, like on the diagonal, you put all the the degrees of every node. So like. Uh, one one that is two with like that's the degree of the one node, and then yeah, you just split it up along the diagonal. So the next part is also called it's called the adjacency matrix, and it represents the graph by connections between the nodes. So for example, uh, like you say that there's an edge between one and two, but maybe there's no edge between one and four. Yeah, so basically like you go through the matrix and like uh for example one one there's a connection or like one two there's or one one there's no connection and one two there's a connection and so on. So that fills up the entire matrix. So I'll talk. Now now I'll go through the notebook. Okay, so uh, we see there's this library, it's called Network X. It allows us to uh, create a graph very easily. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the library is called Network X, and we can basically use this to build graphs. So first, you can import a library like this. Import network access and x, and do g dot x dot graph. So this creates a empty graph.
Okay. Uh, so while waiting for this to run, uh, I'll go through the next part. So uh, basically, to you can to add stuff to this graph, you can like add nodes and stuff. So first, you can add a node like this, like g dot add node one. And you can also add nodes from any iterable container. So this refers to things like lists or sets. Or tuples, like anything you can loop over. And you can also add nodes along with attributes for those nodes. And, like, yeah, so you can do it in this manner. And if, for example, you already have a graph and you just want to add the nodes from that graph to this graph, then you can just do g dot add nodes from page. Or you can even add graphs as a node within another graph because uh, basically for this library, what you can do is that your nodes need not just be integers or in, or some simple data type. They, you can add anything that is hashable as a node in the graph. So if you think about like Python dictionaries, you can also use anything that is hashable as the key. So it's the same thing for graphs. You can use anything that is hashable as a node. So this makes it quite convenient actually because for example, if you want to store a graph of documents, maybe like the documents are citing each other, you can very easily do that by adding the documents directly. And you can also uh, grow the graphs by adding edges. So you can add edges like this one at a time. Or you can add a list of edges, like, uh, and, like you can put edges in an iterable container, like a list or a set, and just add that. And you can also uh, add like edges from another graph. So instead of doing add edges from H, just do H dot edges, and this will return the edges from that graph. You can add them to another graph. And you can also clear the graph so that it becomes empty again by using dot clear. And when you add uh, edges or nodes to a, a graph. What happens is that even if they already exist, network X, network X will just ignore uh, the fact that they already exist, and it won't really throw an error. So uh, you can see here now we have uh, eight nodes and three edges. Yeah. And we can also like do stuff like this. Like basically, you can have a uh, if there are like graph constructors. Which means that you don't always start from an empty graph. You can you can start with a graph with some nodes inside of you, and then you can use that to build up your graph. So next, what we do is that we can analyze the elements of a graph. And there are four basic graph properties which allow you to do this: is g dot nodes, g dot edges, g dot adjacency, and j dot degree. So what these do is that basically uh, nodes and edges just return the edges, nodes and edges, and g dot adjacent, uh, adjacent basically returns the adjacency list of all of the nodes. So like for example, it will return the list of nodes that have an, that are connected to for example node 0 and then node 1 and node 2 and so on. And finally, degree returns the number of edges that are connected to uh, a certain node, which is basically just the degree of that node. And yeah, you can also report the edges and degree from a subset of all nodes using this function. Next, we can remove elements from a graph. So other than adding, you can also remove. So for example, you can remove you can remove them by 
uh, like their value basically. So like you added a node two inside, then you can just remove two. In the same way that you could, you can just access element inside a dictionary by just giving the key. Sorry, if you remove uh, an element and you add another element, it results in an offline version of code. Remove the element that results in a node that is not connected to anything. Uh, the that's called a disconnected graph. Yeah. So multiple connect it's like a disconnected graph. Yeah, it won't handle it. Okay. So it'll just treat it as like so you need to be careful Yeah, yeah. Now you can also build a graph object incrementally. So for example here you can see that we're adding edges, or we can create a diagraph using the connections from G. And basically you can list the edges and you can also like create it directly from edge list. Or you can create it directly from the adjacent list as well. Uh, and like for example, here zero will be net connected to one and two, one will be connected to zero and two, and two is connected to zero and one. So I previously mentioned this, which is that nodes and edges can be any hashable object, not necessarily just integers or strings, or any simple data type, anything that. You can use as a key to a dictionary. You can also use as a node on edge of a graph. And actually, very conveniently, you can also use subscript notation to access the elements of a graph. So, for example, you can see here this is, I've created a graph here, and you can basically access the uh, nodes and edges properties. So, for example, here, this will return the, not the nodes which are adjacent to the first node. Well, not the first node, the node with value one. And then, for example, this will return the attributes of the edges uh, that connects nodes one and two. So as you can see here, it returns color yellow, which is what we inputted at the start. And you can also uh, use this to like set attributes as well. So for example, here we have obtained the attribute and then we can set the color to a different color like red. And then when you obtain it later, it becomes red now. So other than this, we can also very quickly examine uh, pairs of, we can very quickly examine like no adjacency pairs using the this function g dot adjacent c and g dot adjacent c dot items. So you can do this because like g dot adjacent c is basically just a dictionary, and the node values are the keys to that dictionary, and then they will store a list that points to the values of the other nodes. So you can look look over it like you look over a normal dictionary. So you can see here we're basically looking over all these items and we're changing their attributes and you can also very conveniently access the all the edges using uh, the graph dot edges property so now I'll talk about adding attributes so other than adding attributes directly to the nodes and edges you can also add them to graphs so here, for example, I've added an attribute that's day equals Friday to this graph. Or, and you can also modify them later. So for example, here, you can modify it like you modify a dictionary. You just do g.graph and the attribute name equals to its new value. So what are the steps for the attribute of the graph? Does graph will change anything? Uh, it just changes like the, the attribute is just something that's assigned to the graph, but it doesn't change the connections. Yeah. Uh, here you can also see we're modifying the attributes of the nodes. And here as well, this is this this basically modifies the attributes of the edges. Yeah. So uh, the reason why so the reason why we, we might need attributes is that, for example, a node or a certain edge might have a certain kind of property that we care about. Like 
maybe you want to care, maybe you care about like the weight of the edge between two nodes. And maybe like for example, we want to find the shortest path between two different nodes. And so each edge you can store like its weight, and then later you can use that in order to do your calculations. So yeah, yeah it will be the same thing for nodes as well as and the entire graph in general. So next week, there's also this function called diagraph that I mentioned earlier. What this does is that it provides methods and properties which are specific to directed graphs. So this means that because previously this graph class, uh, this graph class here, it works with undirected graphs. And directed graphs and undirected graphs are kind of different because, for example, for an undirected graph, the definition of a degree might be different from that of a directed graph. Where you have an in degree and an out degree, which represents the inward going and outward going connections. <coughs> and some algorithms also only work for directed graphs, while others are not more defined for them. So you shouldn't you should try not to lump uh, directed and undir undirected graphs together. And if you want to convert that, you can use a uh, graph dot to undirected. So next, uh, network X also provides a class for graphs that will allow you to have multiple edges between any pair of nodes. So, for example, this will allow you to have like more than one uh, pet, more than one edge between two nodes. Uh, for example. This might be relevant if you are looking at chemical bonds where maybe like you want to have two edges to represent a double bond, for example. So you can see here that we are basically using a multigraph and we have added multiple edges for uh, the connections between two nodes. And here you can see that we're using a function provided by network x called shortest path to find the shortest path between two nodes. So next, uh, to make it, make it will also make your life a lot easier if you don't have to construct all the graphs from scratch all the time. So network X actually provides some graph generator functions. So like for example, you can do apply classic graph operations, uh, or use a call to one of the small classic small graphs, or use a constructive generator for classic graph. So you can see here that we have all these different generators. So this for example generates a complete graph. This will generate a complete bipartite graph where basically you have the nodes on the two sides and then you're connecting the nodes to each other. Like all the nodes on this side connected to all the nodes on the other side. And we have also some other um, constructors. And these constructors also don't, aren't always deterministic. Some graph constructors can also generate random graphs. So we call these stochastic graph generators. And these are some examples. In addition, Network X actually supports reading and writing graphs to many popular formats. For example, it supports a reading and writing to edge list, adjacency list, a GML, and all these other different types of uh, file formats which you might want to store your graphs in. So you can see here that, for example, we've used the write GML function, it writes this graph to a file path, and then you can read it later, and then the graph will be reinitialized. And finally, you can okay. And next, you can also have use various graph theoretic functions to analyze the graphs. So what this means is that, for example, uh, you can do things like find the clusters inside the graph, or you can look at the connected components. What is the cluster of a graph? Uh, like we see, if you have a graph, like you might want to find the multiple this there are multiple disconnected graphs within that one graph object. So maybe you want to find those. Find the number of them. Is it a same as community? Uh, can you repeat that? Is it a same as community? Um, it's like you can have multiple disjoint graphs in uh, in like one graph object. So like for example, your zero, one, two nodes could be. It's like what you were talking about often earlier. Like there could be multiple like graph objects connected in uh, one uh, graph object. So like for example. Node 0, 1, 2 could be completely connected. 
and then never connected to nodes three, four, five, which are also connected, but never connected to zero, one, two. So essentially, it's like two graphs existing in one graph object. So we can use networks to count that. Yeah. Yeah, in some functions with a large output, we'll also iterate. We can basically like do this to iterate over them and store it in a dictionary to make your life a lot easier. So for example, here we have run the all pairs shortest path algorithm and you can store these in a dictionary for easy access data. So finally, we can also draw graphs using matplotlib. Although network access and not provide these functions natively, you can use matplotlib to draw them. So for example here, we have initialized the graph, uh, basically drawing it with labels and form to it. And well, this format code is to for the labels of the nodes. So you can see here that there's also different ways of representing it. So for example, here you can draw it in a sort of put a, a line that looks in the shell in this manner so that they don't uh, overlap. So that the, the edges don't overlap. Whereas over here, they've just drawn it randomly. So the nodes just position whatever you want, and then the edges will just draw, even if they cross each other. So as you can see here, there are more different options for how you want to position the nodes. So for example here, you can just draw it randomly. But you can also position the nodes in a circle. So that you can see uh, this is like some of the circle. And uh, you're drawing the edges between the nodes. And yeah, these are also some other ways that you can draw graphs. And finally, you can also save the graphs to an image for future use. So here we have saved the, this graph to this image file, which you can open. Oh uh, yeah, and you can also write the graphs like a dot format. Although I did report the library in this case. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so now I will touch on. Wait, okay, I remember this screen. Yeah. I want to show this guy. Now you don't have to go there, but I'll just like, I want to go there. No, 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 I, I won't like, go through it. I'll just like go through it. Okay. And then also share it with the. Uh, I, I think it's showing this. No, but I think the yard. I think you can see it. Yeah, it's there already. It's there already? Okay, yeah. cool, cool, cool. Yes. Hmm. Okay, so uh, now I'll talk a bit more about graph neural networks. So basically, we can split tasks broadly into two types. There's inductive tasks where you have very, with a lot of small graphs. And for example, you might want to do things like classify what type of graph this is. And, your, and the way that you, like, you know, in machine learning, you always have to split data into like train, test, and validation. So the way that you perform these splits is simply by like you put the graph, like one whole graph is within one split and one whole graph is in another split. So like if you're treating them one a single graph as like one whole unit. So an example of this might be molecular classification. Maybe I want to classify whether a certain molecule is pungent or poisonous, and you can use uh, this, and that would be this sort of task. So uh, there's another type of task called a transductive task where we just have one very, very big network. And like, uh, for, like, for example, an example of this would be like friendship networks or like citation networks where the network is just very, very big and it's just one huge graph. And what you want to do is that given that you can see a certain portion of the network, you want to predict the properties of another part of the network. So during training, what you'll do is that you'll mask parts of this graph and ask for predictions end up at those places. Yeah. So, for example, uh, maybe I will mask some of these edges, and then I can ask the whether we want to predict, ask the network to predict whether there is an edge there. Yeah. And yeah, an example is friendship networks. So, but in, in addition, before we can just <coughs> run a network on this graph, we also have to, because we know that uh, neural networks only work on vectors, 
So what we want to do is that we want to sort of turn the graph into a vector. So what we do is that we provide embeddings for nodes and edges. What this means is that each node and edge will be assigned a vector, which we call an embedding. So, yeah, embedding or feature. Like it can be anything. So for example, if the edges are like single bonds or double bonds in a chemical, you can make use of one-part encoding to provide them as provide a categorical feature. Although like it doesn't have to be one-part encoding, you can use anything to you can basically put any vector there. Okay, so basically uh, now we're gonna go into the first uh, type of graph neural network, which is spatial GNN. So we're first gonna talk about why we can't use existing neural network architecture with our graph data, right? So the first thing is why can't we use our standard multi-layer perceptron model or deep neural network, artificial neural network, like what we went through at the start of the presentation, right? Why can't we use that for our graph data, right? And it's because MLPs fail to account for the structural information of the graph. So as Jen was mentioning, right, we could have these graphs with all these features, right, associated with each of them, right? But then if we just feed this feature into like a neural network, right, it's not going to work because it, it fails to account for the structural information of the graph. So for example, if this was a map of cities, right, and there was a storm in this city over here, right? The likelihood of a storm in this city here and this city here is higher than let's say this city over there, right? So because of that, right, we need a, a type of neural network that accounts for like the connections in the graph, right? But an MLP which only looks at this vector, right, and not at the vectors of the neighbors of the node, right, will not be able to account for that information, which is why we can't use standard MLPs, right? So then the next thing that people are like, oh, we should use uh, convolution, right? So convolution, right, uh, is basically you're looking at uh, uh, regions of data, right? Spatial coherence, right? So uh, instead of looking at just one individual pixel at a time, you're looking at clusters of pixels in your image, right? However, the reason we can't apply convolution, at least or CNN in a direct sense, right, is because our graph data is non-Euclidean, right? It is not ordered, right? Like, even though this looks like an ordered graph, right? Each of the graph, each of the nodes in the graph have different amount of neighbors, right? This corner node has two neighbors. This uh, middle node has four neighbors, and so on and so forth. So because our graph has like uh, can have non-Euclidean properties, we can't have a standardized kernel that can fit the entire graph, right? So then we need a way to apply this idea of convolution to graphs, right? So our basic structure for every GNN is kind of like convolution. We have, we need a way to sample the node features, then we need a way to convolve the node features, and then we need a way to pull the node features, and then if we want, we can have stiff connections uh, for fast uh, to prevent like vanishing gradient problem. Or not? Yeah, but essentially this is how we're going to build our GNN, right? So uh, the idea is is that uh, for spatial GNNs is that we want to pass those signals that signal data around the graph, right? So we want to share information between neighbors of graphs, and of course we want the idea of spatial coherence to be maintained. So we look at another area of math where signal diffusion is happening, right, or passing signals around. So we're going to look at time convolution, right? So essentially. This is an example of data spread across time. So x0, x1, x2, x3 spread across time, right? And essentially we're gonna find a shift operator and the shift operator basically shifts the signals down, right? So uh, it moves the signals through time or diffuses the signals through time, right? So you can have multiple shifts, okay? And then it becomes a shift squared if you have two shifts, right? And this is how we do signal diffusion in uh, time uh, in, in signal processing, this is how you do uh, time shifting, right? And then what we do is we take a weighted sum of all these time shifted inputs, right? And then that's our time uh, shifted uh, convolution operator. And then we multiply each of these uh, vectors of, uh, uh, of signals by some sort of coefficient, and then we sum them up and that's our time convolution operator. So. This is a nth order localized uh, time signal. So it accounts for signals across uh, n time steps, right? So essentially the time convolution operator can account, can uh, look at like signal diffusion throughout the graph and then you can use it to uh, like calculate metrics of this signal diffusion uh, throughout time, sorry, not throughout the graph, right? So essentially how can we uh, move this idea of time convolution signal diffusion into the graph domain, right? So what we do is, we replace, instead of time, we look at, uh, we replace it with a line graph, right? So essentially a graph pointing, uh, instead of 
points in time, we look at, uh, we assign each point of time a node, and then uh, every shift operation, we just move the node features down, right? So here, x0, x1, x2, x3, so x0 is on node 0, then we move it down to node 1. So that's our shift operation, right? So that's the, that's how we did it, right? But like, what is the shift operation in this case, right? Uh, for this line graph, right? So actually the inside, the key inside to this is, right, the shift operation is actually uh, the adjacency matrix of the graph itself. So uh, I guess this is a bit unwieldy, but take some time to understand it. So the connectivity between the, this node and the next node is one. So then that means we're shifting that signal to that node, right? So this is how you can use your linear algebra, right? So we take our adjacency matrix and we multiply by our signal and then our signals move down. Yeah. So that's the idea of uh, how we can move our time convolution idea to the graph convolution idea, right? We realize that our shift operator is just the adjacency matrix, right? So now that we have it like, uh, now we have a line of graph, why not just uh, adapt it to all the graphs, right? So we can adapt it to any kind of graph where the shift operator is just the adjacency matrix. And then uh, we have our time general graph convolution filter, which is used in graph signal processing, right? Uh, and basically this is an end order graph signal diffusion uh, convolution, right? So uh, essentially what each shift operation doing is diffusing the signals throughout the graph, right? So we're passing information around that. And that's the idea of message passing. We're passing information between nodes, right? And then we're share by sharing that information, right? Each node contains context of its neighbors, right? And then if we feed that data through a neural network or some sort of NLP of any kind, then we can get a better output or better understanding of what, uh, of what is gonna happen, right? Like now we know that if there's a storm in a city, in a neighbor city, right? That information will be passed on to us, right? So, but then if I'm a neighbor really far away, it's going to take a lot of shifts to get that information to me. So because it takes a lot of shifts, right, uh, that's how we can have a localized, uh, spatially coherent uh, message passion operation for graphs. So at this point, it looks really unwieldy, but uh, I'm going to show you like the, the way of writing it in summations. It's very simple. Uh, that's very simple. But uh, we kind of adapt this general convolution operator to for GNNs. So the thing is, uh, you know, neural networks have multiple layers, right? So we drop all the layers uh, and just take a single layer. So just take the signals and multiply by just the matrix to get the signals back, right? And then we're gonna adapt it to multiple node features. As I said, the node feature can be the entire vector, not just a single value, right? So we just keep the node features of each vector, we organize it as a matrix, and then we can get them uh, output it back uh, as a multi-value neural value. Now we need a way to transform these vectors, okay, or add some trainable parameter to them. Right, so we can again just use the algebra and like just add the matrix at the back, uh, add a weight matrix at the back to transform uh, these signals. So essentially, we're taking these signals, diffusing them, or we're taking these signals, transforming them, and then diffusing them uh, throughout the graph, and then that's our new layer. So uh, this looks very a big complex matrix expression, but this is all it's doing. Essentially, it's taking if if, it, if if you're looking at this graph, this node here, it's taking information from this graph, this graph, and this, sorry, this node, this node, and this node, and then it's summing all of them up, uh, multiplied by some weight shared weight matrix. So essentially, each node has its own weight matrix uh, associated with it, right? Now you guys can clearly see a problem here that uh, the original signal of the graph is lost, or at the graph, uh, sorry, the original signal of the node is lost uh, over here, right? So what we can do is we can add an additional self loop to the graph, so basically adding, uh, replacing our adjacency matrix, adjacency matrix plus i. So essentially, now we're not just looking at uh, all our neighbor's features, but we're also looking at our own feature, and then we multiply it by some weight matrix to transform it to a different layer, uh, node of vector size, and that's basically our layer set. Now, uh, we want to count for, for example, the weight of the edges, or we can just, uh, add the edge weight data here. So just scale how much ever the transform feature is by the edge weight, and then we, yeah, we just add the edge weight data there. Uh, so now this is a very uh, high level understanding from the man, right? Essentially we're just summing and passing things. So Jen will explain it in a better way about how the message passing works in a more visual sense. 
But I just want to give you guys a mathematical understanding of the general thing. So we can generalize it even further uh, to account for different kinds of aggregation. So in this case, I use some aggregation. But then you can use a mean aggregation function, a max aggregation function, any kind of aggregation function you want. Basically, how, how am I going to sample those nodes around me? And then how am I going to add those nodes around me? How am I going to transform those nodes around me? How am I going to transform my neighbors and put it and combine it with my original feature? And instead of using just a single way, I can use an entire linear layer to do that transformation. So these are just neural networks. So essentially what I'm doing is looking, if I'm a node, I'm looking at the nodes around me, taking information from them, multiplying it by some uh, trainable weight value, adding it to myself, and then uh, transforming myself as well, and then uh, adding some sort of neural network activation, and then I get my new value here. So that way I share information throughout my entire graph, and basically I'm not just doing it for me, I'm doing it for every node in the graph. right? So information is shared homogeneously throughout the graph, and which does lead to some problems later on which I'll talk about, but for now, uh, just understand that that's how message passing works. So now in general, we'll carry on with a simple GNN layer. So uh, now I'll give a more high-level uh, overview of what's a GNN layer. Okay. Uh, so basically, you can, like this whole graph, you have the embeddings for every vertex, the embeddings for every edge, and the embeddings for like, the whole graph in general. And the idea of a GNN layer is that you're going to process all these, of these embeddings. So you can see over here that we have basically applied a function on them. This function is usually a um, ML key. Uh, which we talked about earlier. So, uh, currently, if you just don't do anything and just do it like this, it's not very optimal because you can't really the you can't really communicate information between like different nodes or different edges. So, they now we have the idea of message passing, which is that we're going to pass information between nodes, uh, between nodes between edges, and like basically allow the embeddings of the graph, the nodes and edges to influence each other. So we're going to basically we do this thing called proving. So for example, we consider like this green node over here, and we say that uh, this is its neighborhood. So what we do now is that we take the nodes next to it, and we apply this apply a pooling function. As I mentioned this previously, basically it can be uh, a lot of things like it can be maximum or mean, something stuff like that. And then you also combine it with the embeddings of the current node with another function. And this, you can combine these two to get a new embedding. So you can sort of visualize it like this. Uh, so basically, like for example, we take the embeddings of these two and we combine it with the edge embedding, and like you just do it each of them. So this basically forms a basic shaded layer. Yeah, and this is the like the cooling, the update cooling function. So the exact structure of your GNN layer will usually depend on the type of problem that you want to solve, like whether it's node classification or edge prediction, stuff like that. So there are several types of GNN layers. So the first is called a neural FP. So the idea is that nodes with different degrees, like different nodes are of different importance. So we can say that uh, maybe on the pool uh, the pool differently if the node has a different number of connections. So you can see here that we are going to use a different function for pooling based on the uh, the degree of the node, which is the number of connections to that node. So that, that forms what we call neural FP. And now there's uh, another different type of uh, uh, graph neural network. This is called graph stage. So what this does is that, uh, like, Okay, if you think about it, not just the nodes that are right next to it are important. Like the nodes far away can also be somewhat important. So what we do is that we look at the different neighborhoods and where k is like the distance to the node. So for example, you can see here we have the initial blue neighborhood, we have this orange one, and like we keep expanding it upwards. And the idea is that you have this pulling function pk and then MLP to process the new embeddings. So what we do is that we iteratively combine the inputs. Uh, so like you pull the nodes first, and you add the current, like the, the center on next x. And then you just keep doing that again and again. And you keep updating. And yeah, PK is also, instead of using a pulling function, like just minimum, maximum, or mean, what we do instead is that we use 
another more cooling function. So what this means is that you can use a machine. You can use machine learning to train the uh, train the function. So for example, you can use MLPs or LSTMs. And but the issue with this is actually that a lot of these models they don't have the property of permutation invariance, which is what we want inside a cooling function because we don't want it to we don't want the order in which you add the nodes into the cooling function to really affect its output. So to rectify this, uh, in the training process, what happens is that we will randomize the order of the nodes being inputted into the function. So this prevents the function from being from becoming biased towards uh, any of the nodes and basically treating their the way the order in which they are inputted as important. So finally, the I'll also talk about graph attention networks. So typically in your cooling function, you might assign the same weightage to each of the nodes next to it, but some nodes are more important than others. So what we do here is that uh, in there's this paper called Attention is All You Need, and it was it talks about transformers and their use of, use as a language model. So in this, they basically introduce a, uh, a type of layer called the attention layer. This allows models to basically uh, attend to different parts of a sequence. And like basically say that this part of the sequence further away is perhaps, perhaps more important. And then the model will like use those that part of the sequence more in its predictions. So basically how this works is that well, how we use this is that basically you have the attention function and then you give it the embeddings of the two nodes of two nodes and then that will calculate the weightage of that edge between the two nodes and we only and we perform what we call mass attention which means that we only perform this computation on edges that actually exist so for example we won't calculate the this edge weight between like the green that green node and that blue node yeah Uh, so now Zion will talk about spectral GNMs. Or rather, I won't talk about them because uh, again, we're going to cover them later. Essentially, spectral GNMs uh, are part of the optional talk after this. Uh, but essentially, in general, what spectral GNMs are is that uh, instead of referring them as node features, we call them graph signals now. And uh, essentially, uh, if you guys know, like, uh, if you guys are electronics people, or if you know about convolutional neural networks, essentially, they don't do filtering in the traditional sense. Uh, or like filtering on the data itself, they do spectral filtering. So for example, low pass, band pass, high pass, your AM radio, getting a specific channel, they use a band pass uh, frequency filter. So what you do is, is that uh, you take, you get a spectral representation of the graph and then you do filtering on that. So it's kind of like how in convolution you take a spectral, uh, or you take the Fourier transform of uh, your image or, and your, your spectral uh, version of it and then you add your convolution kernel on top of that and you take the inverse transform. So it's the same way, but you have to define a graph for a transform, which I'll go into later. But uh, for someone who is high level implementing the GNN, you won't really need to know what the graph for a transform is, so worry about it. So uh, essentially, uh, your, spatial, your spectral GNNs have like a variable spectral filter, kind of like your convolution with a variable. Uh, uh, but in convolution, you, you also do the Fourier transform on the filter. So I don't know. Some people call it a spectral filter, some people don't. But uh, yeah, essentially, uh, uh, spectral GNLs are for spectral filters. So, uh, in general, your entire graph neural network model, right, is made up of uh, multiple GNN layers. So, like the graph stage layer that we we're talking about, so or GCN or whatever graph neural network model you use. And then there are three tasks you use GNNs mainly for, which is uh, node classification, edge classification, and graph classification. So node classification is like your standard task, like classifying uh, your nodes, right? Like if I have a, if I have a network of cities, uh, will there be a storm in, in that city in five days time, right? So we're classifying the nodes of, which are the cities, right? So that's a node classification task. Then there's edge classification task. Uh, for example, in your neural maps, you're trying to find which, which uh, edges are part of the shortest path, which edges are not part of the shortest path. So that's an edge classification task because you're classifying your edges. And finally, there's graph classification, right? Classifying whether your entire molecule is toxic or not, right? So to do all these tasks, we basically still use the same GNN underlying architecture, 
But essentially, for edge classification, what we do is, is that we look at the two, uh, we look at the two uh, nodes attached to an edge, and we basically combine their features together, and then we feed that through another neural network for edge classification. And then for graph classification, we just take some aggregation of all the node features. Uh, yeah. So it's just the standard GNN layers, which is uh, uh, node, node feature based. And then we can add the edge classification modules later on. Yeah. So now we're going to go into the notebook mode with DGL. But I just want to ask, do you guys need like a break or anything, like a five minute break? Because I've just been talking straight. Do you guys want anything? Like a five minute break? Are you guys okay? Do you guys have any questions about the content so far? Okay. So I guess we can go straight into the, then I guess we'll finish a lot faster if you guys don't want breaks. So uh, all you guys are okay with no breaks. So now we're going to actual implementation of the graph neural network with a deep graph library. So uh, I'll open up the jet, help me open up. So you guys can open the notebook, uh, tinyurl.com slash forceasia.dgl. Okay, so basically DGL is uh, the currently uh, one of the three most used Python graph libraries, which is DGL, uh, PyCard Geometric, and uh, uh, JRAF. So I don't like JRAF because it uses its own machine learning backend that's not PyTorch or TensorFlow. Then uh, PyTorch Geometric is based on PyTorch, and DGL it can be uh, is based. Uh, it can have either have a PyTorch backend or a TensorFlow backend. Now, I don't like TensorFlow, and uh, yeah, uh, I don't like it because uh, uh, it's unwieldy and uh, it's not very really highly used in research. So, uh, usually when you, when you uh, it, nowadays when you tell people, oh, I use TensorFlow, they laugh at you. But sorry if you guys use TensorFlow, by the way. But yeah, but now people are using PyTorch, so we just try to stick with the standard. So, uh, I should have run this earlier, but uh, so, uh, I put the install link for DGL in the top of the notebook. If you guys want to, you guys can look at the. If you guys need the link again, I'll show you. Then you're welcome to watch his DGL if you want to follow along. Yeah, so uh, it's a rather, rather large library, but the Wi-Fi is pretty fast, so that's good. So uh, I'll move on and talk about it. So we're going to take uh, our DGL stuff from earlier, plus our network X stuff. And uh, we're going to have some data processing libraries, numbers and Panda, number and Panda. Then, of course, our Torch uh, and uh, some DGL uh, libraries. So uh, what I'm going to show you is how you can define data sets with DGL, how you guys can use uh, GNNs with DGL. Also, you guys want to take pictures. Uh, I'll I'll give you guys a link of all the information uh, with all the information. Uh, you guys can just approach uh, uh, all of us if you want a link, or oh, we'll show it at the end as well. Yeah. Um, okay, let me run the imports. Yeah. So first, uh, graph representation, right? So uh, as we come out, we were talking about network X earlier, right? And so. Uh, what, what, what a lot of people will do is, right, okay, we do all our graph processing in Network X, now we want to move it to DGL for our training, right? So what we do is, is we take our Network X graphs, right? Uh, it's the GitHub. Just show them the GitHub. I mean, send them the GitHub. Oh, oh no, it's fine. My plan doesn't need that. Okay. So uh, what you can do... Okay, yeah, so basically the function you can use to get a, a graph from network X to DGL is from network X. So yeah, it's a very easy conversion, which is why a lot of people use network X with DGL. Uh, actually, Python Geometric has the same feature, so yeah, it's just a uh, conversion, yeah. So uh, you can also uh, do two network X, which is basically taking your graph from DGL and moving it to network X. Now this has some funny properties. Uh, it automatically sets it as a directed graph. So even though it's an uh, unweighted graph in both directions, it'll, you have to convert it back to uh, an unweighted graph once you do a two network X. So it automatically implicitly puts it as a direct graph. Uh, 
So you can also define graphs in DGL if you're lazy and want to skip skip the network X step. So DGL uses edge lists. So your graph here will uh, you put in your source edges, and your source nodes, and your uh, destination nodes. So you're telling DGL there's a link between zero and one, zero and two, zero and three, zero and four, zero and five. There's an edge between zero uh, between the first uh, with the end value in this list and the end value in this list. Yeah. You can also use PyTorch long tensors as your uh, edge inputs. Yeah. So let me just run that. Uh, yeah, and if you if you don't need to specify number nodes, you can omit that as well. So, yeah. So if I draw this graph out from the dot two network X, uh, you can see it's a directed graph. So zero is connected to one, zero is connected to two, zero is connected to three, zero is connected to four, zero is connected to five. Yeah. So then you can access the nodes by doing g dot nodes and g dot edges in DGL, and it returns a PyTorch tensor. And for edges, it returns the source uh, source nodes and the destination nodes. So now, how do we add features to the graph? So uh, this is all for like show. You don't really have to do it. But what a lot of researchers or a lot of uh, people who use DGL do is they say uh, you can assign data to the graph with g dot end data. And then I can set it some label called feature, and I can assign features to it. So in this case, I'm assigning just random features to the graph. So these are my node features. So for every node, I have a vector associated with them. And basically, it's a four-line vector. So basically, uh, every row is the associated node feature with every node. Yeah. So this is the node feature for node 0. This is the node feature for node 1. Yeah. And basically, this uh, order of the list maps your g dot nodes output. So yeah, uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. Right? Then same for edges, you can do the same thing, but you use g dot e data. And uh, here I assign uh, features to all my edges, and it matches with your uh, source uh, with your g dot edges function. So for example, this feature right here, 0 0.726 to 0 0.3831, is associated with the feature zero uh, associated with the edge zero one. Yeah. So right on that here. So. Uh, now data loading data sets with DGL. So basically, uh, D, uh, DGL provides already a lot of data sets. Uh, so one example is the Cora graph data set. It's a transactive task. So it's one large graph of a bunch of research paper which all cite each other. So that's a graph because the links between them are the citations and then the actual papers are notes. And then the input vector is just a, a one hot encoded vector and it tells you whether a given word in some 1,433 word dictionary is in that. So for example, if the word graph is uh, uh, given the number 30, and then the, the word graph is in that paper, at that point of the feature vector of that paper, uh, at, at the number 30, okay, it will be 1. But if the word graph was not in it, it would be 0. So it's just like 1,433 commonly used words in the entire data set. And then the output is uh, basically, uh, what type of paper it is. So they classify into seven kinds of machine learning papers. Yeah. But essentially, DGL comes in with a lot of built-in data sets. Yeah. And uh, how how uh, and you can view the and, the and essentially a data set is a list of graphs. So you can access. So since it's only one graph, you can just do data set zero to access the the first graph. This is only one graph. And then you can view the end data and the label data of it of the so you see the label data is not one hot encoded in this case. It's just one to seven. Yeah. So if you want to define your own data set right here, right, uh, you need to overload four functions, init, process, get item, and len. So get item just returns the i element of the graphs. Uh, your process is basically your generation of those graphs or your loading of those graphs from your data set. And your len just returns the length of how many graphs are in your data set. Uh, and your init is just initialization and the yeah, name. You don't really put anything there if you don't want to. So uh, essentially, you have to just overload these four functions. And then like you just put your graphs in some list called self.graphs and uh, access them. Yeah. It's pretty self-explanatory. So DGL actually provides a bunch of implementations for commonly used JNN architectures. So like SageCon, GetCon, and then later on, I'm covering ChepCon and GraphCon. Uh, Chebyshev network and uh, graph convolutional network. Uh, essentially, graph convolutional network is the cutting edge uh, GNN right now. But uh, uh, yeah, so but it's a spectral GNN. So I'll explain that in the spectral section. Yeah. So, but before we show you how these different architectures work, we're going to actually build our own GNN layer. 
just to show you how easy it is in DGL, right? So we're gonna just define some graph data here, right? And we're gonna use uh, some features of DGL uh, to, uh, you, to basically do our computation for us. So the first one is called GSPAM, or Generalized Fast Matrix Dense Matrix Multiplication. And what this does is, is that it uh, basically does your message passing step. So uh, what it does is, is that it takes your, uh, it multiplies, so uh, the example of this general sparse matrix matrix function is u mul e sum. So that means you're, uh, you're gonna, you want to multiply by edge weights and then you want to sum aggregate, right? So what this will do is, right, uh, currently we have three nodes, right, with all these given uh, uh, pointed, uh, all these given connectivity and all these given features, right? And we want to do message passing for them, right? So to do the message passing, we want to multiply them by their edge weights and then sum them up, right? So what it does is, is two comma three, right? So that's this node here, right? Oh, sorry, this, that's this node here. So it's only connected to itself. So, and this, the weight of this edge is just one. So the resulting uh, node feature is two, three, one times two, three, right? Now if you look at this node here, there are two nodes pointing to it, uh, there are two edges pointing to it, this node here and this node here. So we take the feature of this node and multiply it by this edge weight, and we take the feature of this node and multiply it by this edge weight, and we sum them up. Yeah. So like that, it does it for you. It does it for you. So essentially, uh, GSPMM uh, basically does the multiply by edge weight and the sum step. It does it all for you uh, in one uh, fast function. Yeah. And then uh, uh, we have uh, GSDDM functions, dense dense matrix. Uh, uh, multiplication. Uh, there's no cool way of saying it, but essentially this is one where you want to have a custom pulling function or a custom aggregation function. So a lot of GNNs they just use multiply and sum, right? So in that case, you just want to use your standard uh, uh, GSPAM functions. But some of them they want to use uh, uh, like more more complex uh, steps, right? You want to have a more complex pulling function, then you can use GSDDM. So here I define my own pulling function. I named after myself, right? Basically, I sum up the nodes and I just add one. So instead of just a plain sum, I just add one. This is just an example, right? And instead of like putting in the actual values here, I'm using this new library called DGL function, right? So DGL function is, I can define it for general uh, nodes, right? So remember the, the feet and the weight I was defining earlier, this is where I can use. So essentially, uh, I can do fn.u multi Take the features, multiply by the weights, and do, uh, and then store it in this value called mailbox, right? So it just creates a new tag called mailbox where it stores those multiplied values, right? And then take that mailbox value and then pull it in some way with sum and plus one, yeah. So uh, essentially, this is really good for when you're doing your defining your JNNs because then you can just write out this function and then feed it to your graph update all propagation function and your pulling function. It'll automatically update all the nodes in your graph for you. So this is a more direct way. You have to assign stuff yourself. But with this, you can just automatically do it for you. So a lot of GNNs just use uh, GSDDMM. They don't really use GSPMM. So yeah, you can see the node data is updated uh, already. Yeah, with the new pulling function, which adds one. So here, I made up this uh, own, uh, my own GNN architecture right here. Now it looks very complicated. But it's kind of similar to what I was talking about. You're taking all your neighbor's nodes, multiplying them by some way, minusing them off from our original feature uh, node multiplied by some other weight, right? And then we're just multiplying by some constant, which is just uh, the number of neighbors that this uh, given node has. And then we're adding some bias, and then we're adding some activation, right? So the way we, we code this out, right, is, uh, so I'm naming this after the organization part of BBCS, right? Uh, so we have two weight matrices. So we have two nn dot parameters uh, uh, for the weights, which is your in features and your out features. Since it's a, if you have a five to four GNN layer, a five vector to a four vector, it would be a five times four matrix. So in that case, you define your two weights, weight one and weight two. Then you define your bias parameter with nn parameter as well. It's just a vector, right? And then uh, reset parameters is basically just how you're going to set your parameters. And then activation is if you have an activation function, you can feed it in. So uh, now we can code it like this. Uh, essentially, we have our aggregation function here for uh, 
this step of our uh, of our uh, layer, right? But the thing is, right? Some data doesn't have edge weights. So what we can do is that if edge weight, if there are edge weight data, then we use a mul e. We use a multiplication. We multiply by edge weight data. But if there's no edge weight data, we just copy off the no data, right? And that's how we define our aggregation function, right? Uh, now this is just uh, instead of using the n data and e data we use, we use this uh, these these terms source data and DST data. They're actually the same thing, but they have different names for like convenience of the reader. And essentially, this one will not. Up if you use source data here, it won't actually update the graph. It's all local to this function, which is why it's used a lot. So this step here is we're just calculating uh, this entire term here. So we're just using a standard matrix multiplication operation uh, with the weight. Uh, and then for this, uh, we're taking the, again the features from here and multiplying it by the weight. Right? So then once we, ha we have our pool functions, we can uh, define our sum functions. Right? So our, uh, our sum function will update, uh, will uh, take in our aggregation function and our pooling function. So as I said, that a pooling function will store in the mailbox, right? Then we're storing this value in uh, h, yeah. So it's it's aggregating with this function right here, and then it's storing this value in some value called uh, h, right? And then finally we put all of this stuff together. So we take this term right here, this term right here, and this term right here, and we add them all up to get our final RST value. And then if we have an activation function, we use it. Otherwise, we just return the value. So it's very simple to define. Uh, Spatial GNNs or like any kind of GNN with uh, DGL. Essentially, you're using these GSTD MM functions, which can you know, do your pooling and your summing automatically. Now, it does this in like this mailbox technique, right? The reason it doesn't like this is because there can be some optimization optimization done, right? Uh, it can reduce the time complexity of uh, of how fast you do the operation. Yeah. So that's the that's the good part about it. Yeah. So now. That you uh, now that you can know how you can make your GNN layer, you can define composite models uh, with different GNN layers. So this one I'm using the GraphCon uh, layer that I talked about earlier, and essentially uh, I can apply these the same way as I apply in PyTorch. So I take in the graph and the in features, then it returns some value. Then I can feed that through uh, the ReLU function, the activation function. Then I can apply the convolution layer again. Yeah. So I can define a composite model with multiple layers. So this has two layers in this case. Yeah. And then I can just feed in the values uh, I want for this. So how many in features, how many out features, and the number of classes. So now I'm going to run a node classification on this DGL data set, the Cora graph data set. Uh, and Cora graph data set comes in with built-in train mask, validation mask, and test mask. So what I do is I first like define some uh, ways to like measure the accuracy of the model throughout time. And then I run it for a certain number of epochs for this part. Okay. Uh, logic is basically uh, what we're gonna uh, what the model outputs. So as I said, the model outputs seven values, right? Of what what is the most likely class is it gonna be part of. But then our data is in the form one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this argmax function just gives us one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, argmax, maximum index. Yeah. And then that's our actual prediction. And then we do our loss function. We basically calculate the error of this case. And then uh, we just, this, all of this is just like ways of printing, testing the training accuracy, testing accuracy, uh, and whatnot. Yeah. So if I run this here, and then I run my model. Okay, it's fine. You guys just add this line to your, uh... yeah, so you see it starts training. Uh, add the model definition again. Uh, model definition is local to the uh, cell you declared in, so that's why the bug happens. But you see over time the loss decreases and the accuracy increases, which is the goal. Yeah, so that's basically node classification. We're classifying those nodes. Yeah, now Jed uh, is going to talk about uh, link prediction and edge classification. And uh, graph classification. Uh, hello. So now I'll talk about link prediction and edge classification. So the idea behind this is that basically I have a graph and I have some nodes and edges in the graph. 
And what I want to do is that I want to predict whether there is an edge between two different nodes. Okay, so uh, first we can load the data set. Uh, I think we're using the same data set as the previous one. And we can just uh, do this stuff. Then. This is just processing data. So first we split the edge set for, for training and testing. And we see we find all the negative edges and then we remove all the edges also. And we remove the edges because like, we want to predict whether there's an edge. So that's what we're predicting. So for this, we'll actually use the graph stage mode. Yeah, there are some blanks here. I'll go that in. So we see first what we want to do for this model is I want to there are two contributions that we need to insert, and so as calling the activation function. So uh, we can basically use the sage. We use the sage call function. So you can see here, like it's important import already, and we like put in the in import features the H features, and we say that we want the cooling the mean cooling function, and we basically do the same thing for the second convolution, except that now it's uh, just H features. So next from this part, uh, what we do is that we call the first convolution, and then we call a activation function. So the activation function need not necessarily be redo, it could be something like switch as well. But in this case, we choose to use redo. And then we can call the second convolution. So you can see here that this basically forms the structure of the GNN that uh, Zion was talking about previously. So then next, we construct the positive and negative graph for the training and test set. And yeah, and the idea, wait, no, I think, yeah, so the idea is that now, after we apply all the GNN layers, what we want to do now, like all the nodes and have an embedding. So, how are we going to predict whether there's an edge between the two nodes? What we do is that, I mean, you could use a more complex function, but in this case, you just can do a dot product of the two embeddings and based on, and that will give you like some vector. And based on that vector, you will know whether there's an edge there or not. So, here we see what we do is that we apply the dot product between uh, between like this stuff. So like we see this is applying this function across all the edges. And with that we can construct the final model entry. So you can see here like this is the function for the loss and the AUC score. So now you can see here that we're basically looking over, we're running the model, and then we're also computing the loss and basically doing back propagation in order to optimize the weights of the model. So you can see here very nicely that the loss goes down. And it's actually not done conversion yet, but we'll just let it run into here for now. And now you can compute the ROC AUC score, which will measure how well the model performs in predicting the presence of an edge. And you can see here that it attains uh, quite a high score of uh, 87. So next, uh, this is graph classification. Yeah. So for this uh, task, we'll use the proteins data set, which is uh, this one. It's a synthetic data set with a bunch of graphs and it has some nodes. So uh, we'll wait for a while for the So what happens here is that we're building the data loader, data loader, and we see this. Well, this gets a sample of the data set, and then this basically builds it with graph data loader, which is a function which is provided by TGL to make it a lot easier to load the graph data sets. So here we're constructing the batches. So we in, in machine learning we always have batches because. It's very difficult for you to do back propagation across the entire data set. So you split it into multiple batches, and for each batch at the end, you will, you compute the gradients over a single batch and you use those to optimize the model's weights. And this is just showing like the edges in nodes and edges of the graphs inside the each batch. So now we can actually build the graph convolutional network. 
this is actually a spectral gene and enzyme we'll be talking about it later. Yeah. So uh, we can also use DGL.NN, which has already pre-provided the graph convolution function. So similarly, the first convolution takes in in-feeds and h-feeds. And the second one uh, takes in h-feeds. So now we can also call the first convolution and similarly we call an activation function. So you can actually see that the structure is very similar to the previous uh, GNN layers. And finally we have the pull-in function at the very end and in this case we're using the mean pull-in function. So it's taking the mean of all the nodes in the neighborhood. So finally we can train the model. And you can see here that we're doing the same thing. We're basically helping in the loss and we are going back propagation across every batch. So if you give it some time to train, uh, it'll output the test accuracy at the very end. Yeah. So you can see here it attains a test accuracy of 26%. <laughs> yeah, I think it's kind of low, but we're just trying to show you like the idea. Okay, so now that's like basically everything you need to know for like GNNs. But for fun, we're going to talk about some spectral things. So actually, we're running quite early. Uh, we're going to put you guys breaks. Do you guys want any breaks, by the way? Anything you guys like need brain break? Okay. No need? Okay, then sure. I'll continue this. Okay, so now spectral DNA and spectral filtering on glass. This is like the more theoretical part, but I'll try to simplify it down uh, because it's like a bit unwieldy, as I said. So essentially, spectral, what is spectral filtering? So it's like filtering data in like the spectral domain. So you get a frequency representation of data, and then we understand it uh, in, uh, and then we understand filters on it. So for example, an example of spectral filtering in the use case is like, so in the, in, now we use FM radio, but in the old time we used AM radio. So how AM radio works is that it's an amplitude modulating radio wave, and they all be streamed at different frequencies, right? But essentially every broadcasting station will be splitting out their AM radio waves. And the thing is waves interfere. And in the end you get this really noisy signal of all the AM waves in your radio, right? But then we, what we want is our specific channel to listen to, right? So we need a way to extract the frequencies that make up this wave, right? The frequency of waves that make up this entire co combined wave, right? And get that specific frequency related to the radio channel we're listening to, right? So this is actually called band bandpass filtering, right? And I'll show you how uh, I'll show you what it, uh, a code, code of it later, right? But essentially, before we do any kind of spectral filtering, we need a way to get these frequencies of these signals that exist in the graph, right? So what we need is a spectral representation, right? And this brings us to an uh, idea that is a bit complicated, the Fourier transform, right? It's like introduction to engineering class. So a signal basically, uh, essentially there was this guy named Joseph Fourier who was trying to solve a heat diffusion equation. And he's, he realized that any signal can be bro basically broken down into uh, sinusoidal waves. So like your waves like sine, cosine, uh, E, E, I, X waves, right? And essentially what the graph, what a Fourier transform does is, it takes that signal, okay, and gives you the waves that make up that signal and then it causes a pulse at those points, right? So essentially the spectral representation is like the plotted frequencies. So if we had this graph here made out of three different waves, right, plus a bit of noise, you'd have peaks at where those waves frequencies are, right? So for example, if this wave has a frequency of one hertz, then it'll be one in the it'll be it'll be a pulse at the one point. Then if that wave has a frequency of two hertz, then there'll be a pulse at the two hertz point. So essentially, the transform that takes from this uh, time representation to this frequency representation is called the Fourier transform, right? So for a signal, for a single standard signal wave, right, it'll cause uh, just a single pulse, right? So it's actually a pulse to infinity because I'll explain to you why that is later. But then if you have like a more complex wave, like this is called a sync function, sine pi x over pi x, uh, or sine x over x, basically, 
It looks like this, and it's actually made of a bunch of waves, right? Or uh, entire band of waves, right? A, a band of continuous waves centered around zero. So it, it causes a graph that looks like this, like a square, because essentially all the waves that make it up fit within this band. So it's made up of all the waves that exist here to some degree. Yeah. So basically, how does the Fourier transform work? So this equation looks very unwieldy as well. But essentially, the e to the ix term is basically, uh, you're, just think of it as a sinusoidal wave. Ignore it, just think e negative iwt, just think it's a sinusoidal wave. And the w, or the omega, okay, is effectively your frequency term. So the higher your omega value, the more frequent your graph is. So what our Fourier transform is, is basically, uh, for every, we're looking at a bunch of, uh, we're making our entire signal and multiplying it by increasingly frequent waves, right? So, uh, uh, to understand what, uh, or like the inverse of increasingly frequent, frequent waves, right? So, for example, we have a function cos t plus cos 3t, right? And we have our uh, values here. Uh, we write it out in our ei notation. Essentially, it just becomes uh, 1, negative 1, 3, negative 3, omega. Yeah. And then we take, we look at our function here, ft, e negative t. When we take our first term, e to the it, multiplied by e to the negative it, we get 1. So essentially, we're just integrating over the entire one, and that's just infinity. So that's why there'll be a pulse with, uh, at the frequency that is associated with it, right? So that's just uh, so the reason why you need to understand why the how the Fourier transform works is like okay, we have this Fourier transform for the time domain. How can we apply this Fourier transform for graphs? How can we have a graph Fourier transform, right? Oh yeah, and there's also the inverse Fourier transform which takes in the Fourier transform and just inverts the signal. That's just yeah, that's just the main. So there's the existence of the discrete Fourier transform uh, right here, which basically is uh, a way of uh, doing the Fourier transform, but for a discrete space, right? So from like for like matrices. So as I mentioned, convolution, right? So convolution actually is uh, n to the four, uh, n four, n to the power of four complexity naturally, right? But essentially, convolution is, uh, can be done really fast, really fast if you convert it to the Fourier domain, uh, the spectral domain. Right, or you do a Fourier transform data. So your convolution speeds up to O n squared log n uh, with this. So yeah, and also the thing to note about uh, this discrete Fourier transform is that it's circular in nature. For example, if you have a pulse at one, right? You also have a pulse at n minus one because negative values don't exist uh, in like a discrete space. So uh, like it's always zero to n. So if you have a pulse at two, then there'll also be a pulse at n minus two. But then in your standard Fourier transform, you see a pulse at one, then we have a pulse at negative one as well. So now I'm just going to show you how you do that in code. So you guys can use the, oh wait, I didn't even attach the link here. But uh, yeah, you guys can look at this one. tinyurl.com slash fossasia for a, Uh, yes. Okay, so this is just the discrete Fourier transform. Wait, Wait Jen, your sign in is required. Uh, okay, yeah, one second, maybe Jen sign in. But uh, essentially, I'm just going to show you the Fourier transform on different plots. Just do what? Oh, you're going to do that again. Okay, yeah. So uh, the one I'm using, so the one that I'm using is just uh, the standard NumPy network X libraries to show you this, right? So I'm gonna run this discrete Fourier transform on a few signals and show you what you get. Uh, let's run that. Okay, we're just loading the libraries. One second. So essentially, if I run it on this, uh, if I run it on this uh, simple sign function, right? You see that there'll be a peak at uh, this is a sine function with a one hertz at one hertz. So there'll be a peak at one and there'll be a n minus one. And I'm running it from zero to four pi. So yeah, there'll be a peak at four pi minus one and a peak at one. Yeah. So uh, there's uh, so FFT is in a complex domain. So there's a real and uh, imaginary component to it. But uh, essentially, they're kind of parallel to each other. So you can just think of them as like uh, it just tells you the 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 sort of polarity, like if it's a negative sine x or a positive sine x, you can look at the real imaginary, but for our level case, we don't have to look at that. So if you look at the 
the filter, if you look at uh, a smooth function uh, x, right, you'll see that the, there's a there's a number of waves at a higher, there's more waves at, that can, at a higher frequency, and there are less waves at lower frequency. Uh, sorry, there are more, there are more, essentially, the wave has more, is made of more lower frequency waves and less higher frequency waves. Yeah. So essentially, by looking at uh, a function, we can uh, look at a function MFT, we can see what type of frequencies a wave composes it, right? So from this case, we can tell that uh, X is made of many lower frequency waves and uh, uh, and many and very small higher frequency waves, like less high frequency waves. You look at this from the real graph as well. So the thing is, right? We can view our uh, our Fourier transform as like this case here as a matrix operation as well, right? Essentially, this is called the I don't know why it's a different color, weird, but uh, essentially. If you guys, I should just Google this. Uh, so this is called the discrete Fourier trans uh, the dis discrete uh, Fourier transform matrix. It's essentially a matrix of uh, that that just is the same as the Fourier transform function. So as I said, this is an ON square. Uh, if you do it like this, it's ON squared. But because of uh, the thing called, uh, I don't call fast Fourier transform, it can be done at ON log n. But I'm just trying to show that you can use it uh, like that. And essentially, it's the same thing. Uh, it's a bunch of increasingly frequent waves. Uh, so that you see, the first wave is like very smooth. It's just straight one, right? So there's no movement at all. There's no uh, high frequency to it, right? And then as we go down the list, it becomes more and more frequent. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think the mic died. Okay, I'll just speak really loudly. Okay, so with this, right, uh, we can uh, we can basically uh, see what our uh, DFT is made of. Yeah, as I said, increasingly frequent waves. So you see the first wave right there in our DFT, uh, in our uh, discrete Fourier transform matrix, is really smooth, right? But as we go down, it becomes increasingly less smooth, right? So uh, this should look like a wave, but because of how it's how Mandelbrot it draws, it looks a bit weird. But just it's a, a more frequent wave. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah. So now uh, we can apply the bandpass filtering as I was talking about earlier. So essentially, we have this wave, uh, this complex wave made of 10, 15, and 20 hertz sinusoid, and we apply this 13 to 17 hertz bandpass filter to it. So what we do is right is we take the Fourier transform of this signal right here. And then what our bandpass filter does is, is that it's zero, it's defined as zero for all these points, and it's defined as zero for all these points, but it's defined as like a hump, or like a, a like a, a like an upward curve for like the point from 13 to 17 as shown here, right? So when you multiply this, right, with this, we basically isolate out the specific frequency we want. And then that's how we get the specific frequency we need for our uh, uh, for like our radio channel. So we'll get some complex wave made out of all these different uh, more waves, but then we get that specific wave that we want using this uh, bandpass filter. So we get our spectral representation, ignore the waves next to it, just get the frequency we want, and then, yeah, and then apply it, yeah. So uh, now I'm gonna go back to the slides. So now that you guys know about uh, Fourier transform on uh, normal signals, we're going to apply Fourier transform on graphs right now. So essentially, if we can find a uh, Fourier transform on graphs, we can do spectral filtering on these graphs, right? And I'll show you an example of that as well. So essentially, for a graph Fourier uh, transform, we can't use some normal modification of the existing Fourier transform because our data is non-Euclidean. It can be any sort of combination, right? So what we need is, is we need basically uh, we need is uh, similar to what we need is we need lower uh, value, uh, we need lower, uh, we need low frequency uh, signals at the top, high frequency signals at the bottom. And this frequent, now I'm just showing it here as like a matrix, right? But essentially this higher frequency must be represented on the graph signal, right? So there should be higher frequency waves at the bottom or higher frequency waves in the graph and lower frequency waves uh, at the top. So. Uh, essentially, we need a way to measure the smoothness or the frequency on these graphs data. And for that, we need two tools. We need the Laplacian matrix, which is a way of measuring divergence in the graph, and we need eigenvectors and eigenvalues, right? 
So what is an eigenvector and eigenvalue? Essentially, it's, uh, it's basically, as I said, matrices are transforms of vectors. They rotate and scale vectors. An eigenvector or an eigenvalue, an eigenvalue pair is that an eigenvector, if you add a matrix to it, uh, if you multiply a matrix by the eigenvector associated with the matrix, right, it'll only scale the vector. It'll not rotate the vector. So you see here, the vector basically remains on its own span. So we take this vector here, multiply by this matrix here. All it does is scale the vector. It just increases the size of the vector or decreases the size of the vector, but it never rotates the vector. So that's what an eigenvector is, right? So basically, for this matrix here, 0, 1, negative 2, negative 3, we have two eigenvectors, negative 1, 2, negative 1, 1, right? And the associated eigenvalue is the basically the value it's scaled by, right? So this is important because uh, uh, there'll be n eigenvalues for any n by n matrix, n eigenvectors for any n, n by n matrix. And what we need eigenvectors and eigenvalues is for eigen decomposition. So because uh, AQ, because our uh, matrix times some vector, is equal to a vector times some scalar value. We can basically write our entire matrix in terms of uh, eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So each of these are associated eigenvectors, and each of these are the associated eigenvalues as a diagonal of the matrix, right? And then this matrix last year is just the inverse matrix of this one. So we can effectively write our entire matrix in terms of its eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Right now, why is this useful in linear algebra, right? Is because in linear algebra, squaring matrices or taking powers of matrices, right, is very computationally expensive because you have to multiply the entire matrix by itself, right? And that's n cubed or n log 2, 7. Uh, but just think of it as n cubed, right? So, but what you can do is if you take the eigen decomposition, n cubed, right, you can get this diagonal matrix of eigenvalues. And then you can square this, right, and then multiply it back by its eigenvector pairs, you get the squared representation, yeah. So that's the value of eigen decomposition, but I'll show you how you use it later. Right? So for the matrix earlier, I, I used eigen decomposition on it to show you. Yeah. And basically, these eigenvalues are sorted by uh, from large, smallest to largest. This is very important. The eigenvalues are sorted from smallest to largest. Yeah. So now this brings us to the Laplacian matrix. Essentially, it's uh, the degree matrix of the graph minus the adjacency matrix. So for example, node 1 has a degree of 2, node 2 has a degree of 3, node 3 has a degree of 2, node 4 has a degree of 1. That's its degree matrix. And then it's associated adjacency matrix. And we basically take the degree matrix and subtract it from the agency, adjacency matrix, and we get our uh, Laplacian matrix. So why it's called the Laplacian matrix is because Laplacian is also known as the second derivative operator. right? And basically, it's a way of measuring convergence and divergence in a graph. So we have an existing uh, graph signal, right? And we, also, we add the graph Laplacian to it, we can measure how converging or how diverging those graph signals are, right? So what we, for example, here, right? We take our Laplacian matrix. Uh, we look at this graph here, and we multiply it by some signal f, right? What we do is we're taking this uh, this node right here, multiplying it by its strength, and minusing off its neighbors. So we're measuring the basically the convergence and divergence in the thing, or the strength of uh, each of the nodes in the graph, right? So why this is useful, right? Is basically when you, uh, if you define your signal like this, you take the transpose of your signals, multiply by the passing matrix, and multiply them by the, the filters again, right? You can see what it's doing is, is basically comparing every node by, with each other, right? And then summing all of them up, right? So really, what is comparison between nodes? Highly frequent data, very rough data, not smooth at all, is going to have a very high value. But very smooth data, where values are very close to each other as neighbors, right? They're gonna have, it's gonna have a very low uh, value. So essentially, this is our measure of smoothness, right? So uh, now we get our measure of smoothness on graphs, right? I can show you here. This graph signals right here, right, are very uh, is very smooth because it's all continuous, right? So it's only one zero crossing, right? But you see the the, the waves gradually the, across the graph data, the waves become. I mean, the the data is smoothly distributed. However, for this graph right here, you see that the data is all uneven, jagged. It jumps around a lot. And that's very rough, right? So now I'm going to show you these uh, graph signals with code. I'll once again go to the same uh, graph signals. So the way I plot these signals on the graph is basically I, uh, I did do this myself because basically uh, I'm doing a very niche task. 
but essentially, uh, I find a, I found a way to basically you take in a graph and you can plot signals across that graph. So, yeah, so I plotted positive and negative signals across the graph. So this is the smoothest measurement from the Laplace transform, as mentioned earlier. So if I look at these signals right here, right, this is all even signals. So the difference between these two signals, these two signals, these two signals is very small. So it's a very smooth data, right? So uh, essentially, if I run the smoothness measurement on this, it has a smoothness of zero, which means uh, the closer the value is to zero, the more smooth it is, right? But if I look at these signals here, which are very jagged and uneven, right, and I run it, right, we see the smoothness value is like 28. So it's a very unsmooth, very rough data. So now that we have a measure of like smoothness, right, we can start to define our graph Fourier transform, right? So that. So, for example, uh, what the graph Fourier transform is is you take the eigen decomposition of the Laplacian matrix, right? And the reason we did this is is, is kind of intuitive because the thing is the Laplacian matrix is symmetric, right? So what's in, when you take a symmetric eigen decomposition, the Inverse of the eigenvector matrix is always its tran transpose. It's called orthogonal property, right? So the eigenvector matrix here, right, and its inverse is just the transpose of each other. Now, remember what I was telling you earlier about smoothness? So since the eigenvalues are sorted, right, by uh, size, right, we see that for every pair of uh, eigenvector, Laplacian eigenvector, right, we have an increasing eigenvector. So our, essentially, our graph Fourier transform, right, is if we define it as the transpose of the eigenvector matrix, essentially, it's telling us that all the eigenvectors become less smooth, okay, or become more become of a higher frequency as we go down the eigenvector matrix. So our first eigenvector will be very smooth, our next eigenvector will be very jagged, and the, I mean, our next eigenvector will be less smooth, and our last eigenvector will be very jagged, right, and. Uh, the reason why you can see this, right, is because the eigenfunctions, which is like a neighbor of eigenvectors, right? Jane, the computer stopped working. Uh, but, oh. Okay, yeah. So, as I said, the eigenfunction uh, operation is zero. Okay, yeah. So the D, so if you take the, the standard Laplacian or the second derivative, and you take its eigenfunction, which is like eigenvectors, right? We see that it's the inverse Fourier transform basis. But if we take our Laplacian matrix and we take its eigen decomposition, we get the inverse graph Fourier transform. So really, the graph Fourier transform is you just take the signals and multiply them by. You take the signals and you multiply them by. Uh, each, uh, basically, you take uh, the signals and multiply them by the inverse of the the transpose of the eigenvector matrix, which is the same as the inverse. And the inverse transform is you take the eigenvector matrix and multiply by x, right? So now this is how we define our spectral filtering, right? In the past, what we do is we take the Fourier transform of some signals, we multiply it by some filter, and then we uh, do the inverse Fourier transform to get the, the combination of them, right? So in GFD, we do something similar. We take the graph Fourier transform. We multiply it by some filter, g, g hat of uh, eigenvalues, and then we add IGFT, and that's basically graph spectral filtering, right? So there are different types of spectral filters that exist. One is you can just use like a, a matrix of uh, a diagonal matrix with, uh, uh, para with random param uh, parameters. This is called a non parametric filter, right? And then you can have parametric polynomial filters, and this becomes just uh, translations of your Laplacian matrix. So it's called so the reason why you include the eigenvectors, right, is if you want your uh, your filter to include some sort of locality to the data, some relation to the spatial spatiality of the data, right? So uh, now I'm going to show you how we can actually do spectral filtering on graphs. So what we're going to do is low pass filtering or denoising, right? So if I open up my uh, graph thing, I'm going to prove to you that the graph Fourier transform first works. Uh, so if you look at the, our graph right here, standard graph, and I plot the first eigenvector of it, so I, I calculate its eigen decomposition with this simple uh, NumPy formula. You see that the first graph is all smooth, right? It's all uh, just, just a smooth continuous signal, all negative signal, but it's very smooth. The next eigenvector, 
right? Is okay. It's it's not as smooth as the first one, but you see there's one zero crossing here. It goes down to a lower. Now we look at our fifth eigenvector, right? Oh wow, it's like very unsmooth, it's very jagged, right? And if we look at our final eigenvector, eigenvector six, right? We can see, oh wow, this is even more jagged, right? So then, uh, if we see our eigenvalues, right, and we measure the smoothness of each eigenvector, right? So the eigen, the, the smoothness is uh, it increases as we go down eigenvector. So this is of a higher frequency, this is of a lower frequency. So that's how our graph Fourier transform works. Essentially. What we're doing is we're generating a bunch of uh, increasingly frequent graphs on our graph data, right? So every graph or air transform is unique to every graph, yeah. And it's essentially the frequency representation of a graph. So now I'm going to do graph spectral filtering on it, on this data. So if you guys don't know what low pass filtering is, uh, it's a very common uh, thing used in signal processing. Essentially, the idea is noise data, right? Noise is very rough. Noise is not smooth, okay? Uh, noise is very random. Right? And therefore, noise not being very smooth is very high frequency. So what we want to do is remove those high frequency signals and get only those low frequency smooth signals from data. So here's a, a graph of data right? I injected with a lot of noise. Right? Now what we're going to do is, is we're going to define this low pass filter. Right? It's a non-parametric filter I use for this one. Essentially, I'm biasing higher, low, low frequency waves, are, uh, I'm biasing high frequency waves, I'm ignoring. Right? And then I apply this filter to my data, and we get a smooth graph. So if I, if I wanted to see a side-by-side -side comparison, see, this is before. We had a very unsmooth, noisy data. And then we got smooth data from that. Right? So we took this graph, added low-pass filtering in the graph spectral domain, and we got this smooth representation of the graph because of low-pass filtering. So basically, uh, you can apply this in like every sort of view. You can apply this in uh, like graphs can images can be represented as graphs. Uh, any kind of a lot of data can be represented as graph, dictionary data, right? And you can always do some kind of smoothness, low pass filtering on it, right? So that's like the real the real power of graph spectral filtering. It's just it has such a wide range of applicability, right? Like uh, researchers at NYT were recently doing uh, uh, like uh, they were looking at brainwave patterns, right? They wanted they, our brain is a bunch of connections, a bunch of nodes. We can view our, view our brain as a graph. So actually, there's a huge amount of impact of graph signal processing on neuroscience research, right? Because what they do is they view the graph as a brain. They need to view like a useless. They want to remove useless signals. They do stuff like low pass filtering, bound pass filtering, right? So low pass filtering is removing the low signals. Bound pass filtering is is filtering a certain range of signals as a certain range of frequencies. And high pass filtering is taking high frequencies only. Uh, I don't think high pass uh, filtering doesn't have that many applications, but uh, if you want to isolate noise, you can use high pass filtering. Yeah. So that basically concludes all the notebook stuff that we're going to go through. And now we're going to finally go into uh, uh, basically the problem with this approach. So the problem is, is that eigen decomposition is way too slow. It's O and Q. So like if I have an image right, of 100 by 100 image, that's 10,000 pixels. So it's a graph of 10,000 vertices. If I feed that into O and cube, it will not kill that. It will be too slow. So what we do is we use approximation, right? And the approximation technique we use is this thing called Chebyshev polynomials. Uh, you don't have to understand what Chebyshev polynomial is. Just understand that the reason why we use Chebyshev, so there's a lot of approximation techniques that exist, like Taylor series, McLaurin series. Uh, uh, yeah. So the reason, we, the thing with Taylor series and McLaurin series, right, is that the error is kind of uh, fixed around a point, right? So, like for example, if I define my Taylor series around the point zero, there's going to be very little error at zero. But as I move further away from zero, the error is going to increase and increase and increase, right? But what Chebyshev polynomial does better, right, is that the error is kind of fixed to a band, right? Now, of course, our McLaurin series approximating the entire infinite series. But our Chebyshev polynomial only can uh, approximate from uh, 0 to 1. Uh, but then you can scale that bound up. But essentially, the Chebyshev polynomial has a fixed uh, error, and the error is spread across the graph data. So we kind of need this when we're approximating graph spectral filters, right? Because we don't want, if we're assuming a very sinusoidal data, right? We don't want one part of the sinusoidal data being very uh, not approximate, another part being very, uh, very close to it. It'll be a completely different signal. So therefore, uh, the Chebyshev polynomial fixes the error. It's very important approximation theory outside of graph spectral filtering, right? 
So for our spectral GNN layer, right, uh, we basically replace this filter with a parametric polynomial filter, right, of like this, right. So the former, the former that I was on about Chebnet, Chebby Chebnet, right, uh, essentially it does an approximation of this uh, filter, right. Again, you don't even know how it does it, just this is how it does it. So you can do a kth order approximation. And for spectral GNNs, you only need, uh, you only need to do one layer. Because you see that the higher layers already account for uh, more neighbors in GNNs, uh, more uh, a wider range of uh, filters, right? And then this scaling term is just the scale from zero to one to zero to the maximum eigenvalue. Yeah. So this is just a scaling term, and this is just a normalization term. Yeah. So now I'm going to talk about the current state of the art model for GNNs, which is the GCN layer, the graph uh, con, right? And essentially, this is just a further approximation. So if Chebnet was an approximation, this is an approximation of an approximation, right? And it's the state of the art model. So essentially what they do is they take a second order Chebyshev approximation, right? And then it, these two are the same parameters, right? So I mean, these two are just parameters. So they just make it one parameter, right? And now this term right here, i plus d minus half a, d minus half, this is just uh, normalized the adjacency matrix based on the degree matrix, right? Uh, Essentially, the problem with this, right, is that if you if you realize, right, if I keep running this for more loops, right, and I'm only renormalizing re the adjacency matrix, but not renormalizing the identity matrix, my gradients can explode or they can vanish, right? So the way I can solve this is by normalizing after every layer, but normalize the entire expression, right? So what I do is I move this i inwards, a uh, a curl is a plus i, and then I also define my new uh, D, I, I wrote that wrongly. Uh, it should be ignore this, ignore this uh, thingy here. Ignore this term. Yeah, but essentially you just sum up the values of the JSON matrix. So uh, actually, this kind of step is a bit abstract. In fact, I don't fully understand it because uh, the people in the paper they just like said, oh yeah, it's to prevent exploding or vanishing gradients. And then like when people ask them. Why, uh, where are the exploding or vanishing gradients, right? Uh, they basically disappeared off the face of the earth. No one can contact them, I don't know why. So we just have to guess. So, but I think it makes sense in that, uh, it, essentially if this term is always being normalized and we're always adding like some scaling constant to it, right? We want to, uh, it'll basically blow out of proportion at certain points. Yeah, because if this is like zero to one, and then this is just adding a whole, uh, it's a whole scale upwards, right? It'll cause like a larger gradient as we add more and more layers. And essentially, for GCN, instead of doing uh, the, the reason they did only a second order approximation, right, is, or first order approximation, right, is because they allow for more layers, multiple layers in GCN, as opposed for Chebnet, there's only one layer uh, for your model. I mean, there can be more, but I mean, normally people just use one layer because it's fine representation, and this is the current state of the R model. So if you see, it's like. Actually, this is even a further approximation. So the kind of scale of the model, model in GNNs is an approximation of an approximation of an approximation. So yeah, uh, really makes you think about life. So finally, we come to the end of our talk, right? Uh, this is supposed to be three hours, but we got it under two. I mean, not under two, but a bit over two. So we talked about spatial GNNs and the idea behind message passing, and spectral GNNs about uh, how they're in the frequency domain, right? And moving forward, right, you guys would want to use, uh, uh, and now this, uh, my English teacher always says that we have to end our essays with a call to action. So uh, essentially, uh, when, you're, when you want to move and do more research, you can guys can try out working with more function with deep graph library. This is the logo for Python Geometric. So actually, uh, when you go to a professor and tell them, oh, I want to do a research project on uh, graph neural networks, they immediately tell you Python Geometric. But Python geometric is like very poorly documented, and DGL. That's why we use DGL for this because DGL is a lot easier to a uh, lot easier to document. So you really should really start with DGL. But once you learn Python geometric, it's a lot more. Uh, I guess it's a, it gives you a lot more power, which is why researchers use Python geometrics. Uh, you guys should also check GSP toolkit, or GSP box, graph signal processing box. Uh, the like Python library is called Pi GSP, right? And essentially, GSP uh, box can help you do graph signal processing on these graph data, right? So as you saw, I did that low-pass filtering in NumPy, right? And I did it in like a bunch of complex steps, right? But GSP can do it in one step automatically. And you can try all different kinds of filters, heat diffusion filter, uh, uh, low-pass filter, high-pass filter, bad-pass filter, whatnot. 
right? And then finally, we didn't cover graph isomorphism network, and uh, which is basically another type of GNN architecture that preceded both spatial and spectral GNNs. So before spatial and spectral GNNs, we had recurrent GNN, recur recurrent graph neural networks, and GINs, right? They're quite, quite archaic, but they're useful in some cases. So if you want to research more about them, you don't have to, but uh, you guys can check it out if you want. Yeah, I just I'm telling you it exists. Yeah. So references is like we have like 18 references not properly formatted. So we're gonna update the GitHub on this topic later. But like special mentions are like basically Xiao Wen Dong is like a Oxford Man Institute lecturer, and he basically does like he's like a lead researcher in spectral processing, spectral uh, graph spectral processing. So like we had to we read like at least six, I read like six of his papers. Uh, yeah, and then uh, the UPenn lectures on signal processing. Uh, that's where I got the time convolution inspiration from. And then you can look at these two review papers uh, right here and right here. So, so basically, the organizing part of is called BBCS, right? And it's about uh, it's an outreach organization to kids, right? We're gonna be uh, uh, basically we're teaching teenagers. Uh, we're giving we're trying to give them passion in CS. Now this talk was quite complex. Uh, which is why we don't want to torture teenagers with it. But uh, if you guys could, uh, you guys could check it out. Uh, basically, you know, if you have a child in secondary school or uh, polytechnic or uh, JC, right? You guys can, uh, yeah. So this QR code basically links to all the documents uh, uh, in the GitHub, right? It also links to my LinkedIn. Jen, you put a LinkedIn. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, you can connect with me on LinkedIn if you want to. Uh, yeah, but essentially this has a link to, the README has a link to both BBCS, all the documents we use today, the PowerPoint, and uh, yeah, basically all our information about our stuff. Yeah, uh, so if you have a, if you have a, our BBCS June conference is in uh, 29 May, 38 May, and 5th June. And if you have a child interested or in it, uh, I, I don't even know why I'm saying child, they're my age. <laughs> uh, if you have someone interested in it, uh, please uh, sign them up for the conference. The sign-ups are opening soon. Yeah. So that's basically it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that's right.